awesome and thank you to some of you who checked on me um, about my friend who passed away I think uh, he is smiling wherever he is because we won the cup Yes. 
lives. I found that she was described as stylish and outgoing, that she had a great personality. She was your typical teenager. She enjoyed going out on the weekends, having friends over. Apparently, she had a pool, so her house was the house to be at. And Irene was just a laid-back parent who accepted all of Missy's friends, so everybody wanted to be there. I had a friend named Missy in high school, and her house was like that, too. And she had a pool. How odd. Now, Karen, Missy's friend, was the complete opposite of Missy. Instead of blossoming into her teenage years, she sort of retreated. She continued to gain weight and started to get really insecure, and she really craved the attention that Missy received. And she would notice that the boys flirted with Missy and not with her. And this really kind of weakened her already weak self-esteem. Now, almost every female has experienced some kind of jealousy, myself included. But for Karen, this really went beyond the typical green-eyed monster sort. She came from a family that didn't make rules for her. She didn't have any boundaries. She never had a curfew, never got grounded, never had any of those, you know, dreaded but really much needed teenage lectures about why things are wrong. And unfortunately, or not unfortunately, I don't know, unfortunately is not the word, because of this, she became a teen mom before she reached adult. self-image and need for attention and acceptance molded her into what she eventually became, which we'll talk about that in a minute, but you already know. Laura Doyle, age 18 at this point, is described as tall and lanky and quite a bit promiscuous. Many people say that she looked pretty decent when she tried, when she put on makeup, this was something that she seldom did, and she was somewhat of a tomboy. She was also um, a pretty heavy drug user who regularly skipped school and hung out with the wrong crowd. Every time Missy hung out with Laura, she would find herself surrounded with drug users, and that made her kind of uncomfortable. Now, Laura and Karen had many things in common, including Relationship 
steps away from Karen. Meanwhile, of course, Karen and Laura start hanging out, and why wouldn't they? They had a lot of things in common, and now their relationship is fueled by a shared hatred for Missy. And they were able to release their frustrations on one another. In a classical girl move, because I'm not going to deny it, in an attempt to make Missy look bad, Karen starts spreading lies about her around school. Of course. Karen tells a group, I couldn't find out how many or exactly what happened, but a group of girls that Missy slept with all their boyfriends. So they stalked Missy, confronted her, and beat her up. I wish I could find more details about exactly what happened, but I couldn't really find out how bad she was hurt or anything like that. After this incident, a student approached Missy and told her that Karen was the one spreading the rumors. Missy, of course, was mad at this girl for telling her that it was Karen's fault because she couldn't believe that her friend would do something like that. Now, Missy is ignoring all the warning signs, but Karen is still doing everything in her power to make Missy look bad in the eyes of other people, especially boys. Every time a boy flirted with M Missy, well, you know, sarcastically teasing or ignoring Karen, Karen would resent and despise Missy even more. Somehow, everything was Missy's fault. During their junior year, Missy started dating a boy named Randy Fernandez. But Randy liked to party a little bit too much for Missy's liking, so she broke up with him about a month after they got together. Now, shortly after this, Randy starts dating Karen again with the girl code. They form a relationship, and they even move in together. Karen gets pregnant like we talked about earlier, and has an abortion. She then gets pregnant again and has a daughter that she named Stephanie. Now Karen, being the not very trustful sort, doesn't trust Randy around other girls, especially Missy. And according to Irene, Missy's mom, Missy once told her about an afternoon where Missy was at Karen's apartment and she and Missy were in her room when Karen asked her to go grab a bottle for the baby from the kitchen. And when Missy walked by Randy, he pulled her into his lap without warning. And of course, she attempted to get up, but this was right when Karen walked in and got super mad at her and told her to leave. Missy, of course, tried to explain, but Karen just wouldn't hear it because naturally it was Missy's, Missy's fault, you know your boyfriend. So, on September 21st, 1985, 12 days prior to Missy's death, Karen and Missy are fighting at this point, and Karen spots Missy at a local park and attacks her with a beer bottle. She slaps her and pushes her before people break it up. For whatever reason, this is what spawns everything into motion. Karen and Laura are fed up and they get together and they formulate this plan to just get rid of Missy just once and for all. So they plan this. They, they get together and they pretend to apologize to Missy and they make her think that everything is sunshine and rainbows. And Missy is excited because her two best friends are this excitement was easily noticeable for her mom, Irene. Karen had a phony talk with her and talks about all her issues with Randy and yada yada. Missy suggests that she breaks up with Randy and that he's a player and that Karen would be better off. But Karen was really upset because this guy that she wanted just didn't want her. fake smile and just pretended that everything is okay. This brings us to the afternoon of October 1st, 1985. Karen and Laura prepare to put their plan into action. 
calls Missy and asks if she wants to go hang out and they could go to Stonehurst Park and talk. Missy's very excited and she tells her mom of her plans and says, hey, I'm going out with Laura. This is where we're going. I promise I'll be home by eight. Irene says, okay. And uh, as Missy's leaving, she turns to her mom and says, I love you. And this made Irene smile and she remembers it very vividly. She remembers that when Laura got to the house, the girls were laughing and talking about boys and seemed very carefree as they drove off. And she remembers how especially pretty Missy looked that day. She was excited to go, and this scene haunts her every single day because the last thing she said was, I love you, which was something that Missy did not apparently do. Now, so Laura has picked up Missy. Unbeknownst to Missy, Karen and her new roommate, Eva, are on their way to the park to meet with them. Now, Eva has no idea what's about to happen. She said that Karen told her that she and Laura planned to scare Missy. She didn't know what they had planned and she didn't know how far it was going to go. They all meet up and they follow each other in their separate vehicles to the park. Now, on the way to the park, Missy is chatting with Laura, completely unaware of what's going to happen. And Laura is eerily calm and shows no signs of anything that would raise a red flag. The girls decide that they're going to go to the National Forest. Now, it's really unknown if this was part of the plan or if Karen and Laura figured that at the point, at this point, the National Forest would be more isolated. So, Karen and Eva follow Laura's car to the forest. They park in a dirt lot near a wooded area, which is located near the creek in Colby Canyon, which is a familiar place to the girls. Karen and Laura get out of their cars and start to yell at Missy who is still sitting in the passenger seat of Laura's car. Missy, of course, has no clue what's happening, and she starts to cry and just get really upset. The girls pull her out of the car and start to get physical with her. Now, this is where... This is your graphic warning, okay? It's... It's not as bad as some of the other ones that we've seen, but I just like to give it. Anyway. Okay. They start to get physical with her. They push her, they shove her, they call her terrible names, and accuse her of sleeping with their boyfriends. Now, Eva is still sitting in the car, watching, and she decides to get out, because this conversation is getting really intense. Missy, who just a couple moments ago was laughing and listening to music with these girls she thought were her friends, is now getting really scared. She's no one to help, nowhere to run and is quickly realizing the seriousness of the situation that she has gotten herself into. Laura grabs her by the wrist and pulls her and says, let's go for a walk. Missy, still crying, hesitates, but Karen comes up and pushes her towards the wooded area. All four of the girls walked down an embankment towards the creek, and Laura and Karen Missy. Laura yanks Missy by her hair and once again accuses her of sleeping with Victor. Laura steps beside the creek and pushes Missy towards Karen, who shoves her back, and Missy falls to the ground. This makes her lose control of her purse, which falls into the mud. Now Missy is frantic at this point and begging for forgiveness. Now this is all the account of Eva, the fourth girl that's not really involved. Missy starts to beg for forgiveness, and she probably just thought that they were going to beat her up and leave her there, but you can tell by her face, according to Eva, that now she's realized that they have other intentions. She starts to plead frantically, but her cries fall on deaf ears. And this is when Eva, who is terrified, runs back to the car. Halfway there, 
she hears Missy scream for help, but she was scared and helpless and afraid for her own life. Eva and Missy were both small, unlike Karen, who was overweight and kind of intimidating. And Laura was tall and aggressive. Eva was in a panic, and she feared that any attempt to stop this pair of girls would backfire on her. Karen and Laura continued to beat and batter Missy. They mainly focused on her face, and this beating is so severe that they rip one of her earrings out of her ear, and it ends up tangled in her hair. One of the girls has some kind of sharp object wasn't really talked about. A rock, a knife, uh, something. Um, they start to cut at Missy's hair. And psychological experts said that this was an attempt to dehumanize her. This is something that is done in many cases like this. And it could have been an attempt to make the very pretty Missy look different, perhaps not as attractive. Laura is shouting, you're going to pay for what you've done. You're going to pay for sleeping with our boyfriends. They start to carry Missy, who weighs 98 pounds. Laura carries her feet, and Karen carries her by the arms, which are bent at the elbow and behind her back. Missy is struggling and trying with everything she has to get away from these girls. The two girls carried her to shallow water that is approximately eight inches deep, and they hold her under until she stops struggling. Then they continue to hold her under for several more minutes. At this point, they spot a four-foot-long, 100-pound log, and they carry it over so that it continues to be submerged in the water. Karen and Laura calmly walk back to their cars and drive away. Missy's body is flat and still in the ankle-deep water, face down, the same position that she was held down in. One foot is placed over the other, and her gold anklet reflected in the afternoon sun. Eva is terrified during the ride back to town, asking Laura, what happened? Where's Missy? She's told that Missy drowned, and although both Laura and Karen appeared speedy and jittery, they showed zero remorse for their actions. A few minutes later, Karen and Laura joined me. Karen jumped in the car and drove away. When I got to the car with Laura, she said, We killed Missy. And I asked Laura, Are you sure that she's dead? And Laura said, She is. And then she said, Missy deserved to die because she slept with Victor, said Eva. Missy, of course, fails to return home by 8 p.m. And this makes Irene very worried. About four hours after, Laura called the Avila house and asked to speak with Missy, but Irene was confused because she thought that Missy was with her. Laura told her that she had dropped Missy off to talk with three boys that were in a blue Camaro while she drove off to get gas, and when she returned, Missy and the boys were gone. Irene goes to bed, pretty unsettled, and it's late into the night before she gets some sleep. The police are called the next morning, and three days later, hikers make the grisly discovery after stopping by the creek. These two experienced hikers were down at a waterbed, and they noticed something different right away. The log that they were used to seeing had been moved, and at first they discovered um, Missy's sock, which had come off during the struggle, and uh, one of the gentlemen noticed long hair floating in the water nearby. As they got closer, they could see that there was a girl in the stream, and that the log lay across her, forcing her face down in the riverbed. They ran for help, and 
her makeup and her clothes. She visited Missy's grave several times a week. And covered the walls of her room with pictures of Missy and newspaper clippings about the crime. Hold on a second. Honestly, I have no clue what she's doing. Losing her freaking mind. Oi. Anyway, sorry. Okay, she repeatedly visit visited Missy's grave and the creek. She used to sit out there and drink. And at one point, she even told Irene that she had seen Missy's ghost. So, not... I, I don't... <laughs> not only did she stay in the house... Irene, but she also continued to torment the family with prank phone calls. For months after Missy's murder, she would call and say, Missy, Missy, Missy. These calls apparently upset Irene so much, and later on, Karen told the family that she was getting the same kind of phone calls, but she was the one making them. Now, Irene kept Missy's room pretty much untouched and fell into a deep depression. The end of this charade really began when Karen suddenly and inexplicably announced that Laura wanted to change her story. Early the prior summer, Karen had summoned Laura to Irene's house, where Laura had haltingly told Missy's mother that she had lied. There had been no blue Camaro, and the truth was that she had dropped Missy off near a church in L.A. to deliver $500 to a drug dealer. Now, apparently, during this time, Eva's, one of Eva's family members committed suicide, and she realized the traumatic thing that Irene must have gone through, and so she tipped off the police. And in July of 1988, the police, acting on this tip, arrested Karen and Loya, Laura, Loya, on first-degree murder charges. According to prosecutors, Karen and Eva, with Laura's knowledge, had followed Laura and Missy to the forest. Eva says that she saw Karen and Laura shouting at Missy and pushing her towards the creek. Eva maintains that, frightened by violence, she retreated to the car and saw no more. Irene Avila fainted when she realized that her daughter's killer was none other than her two best friends. One of these being the same friend who moved into her own house after her death. Irene said that she had no reason to suspect Karen or Laura were involved in her daughter's death. And um, they, she, they said that if Karen had been seething with love and hate, jealousy and guilt, she kept it very well hidden. She'd been talked to several times during the investigation, and not once, said the police sheriff, did they ever suspect that she was in on it. Obviously, Irene never suspected her. So, like I said, they were arrested and charged with first-degree murder. And in March 1990, they were convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. The jurors later said that they were not convinced that the murder was planned. And that's why they did not get first-degree murder charges. Karen was released from prison December 9, 2011, after serving 23 and a half years. And Laura was released December 2012, after serving 22 years. It is absolutely crazy to me that they are now walking free. Granted, people change, but they're walking free, and they killed her for nothing. What is wrong with you, dog? Do not bark at me. Don't, because I am not refilming this. Anyway, sorry guys, I'm going to cut it short so she doesn't 